So welcome everybody um, to this meeting of the Anadown Heritage Society. Um, we're delighted to welcome this evening our Society Secretary, Irene McGoldrick, who's going to give us a, a talk on the mills of Drum, Griffin and Craig. So I'll hand it over to you, Irene. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, yeah, welcome everybody. I'm delighted to be able to give you this presentation tonight on the mills. Um, and I suppose from my point of view, I started out looking at castles in the area and looking at various different documents. Lots of little tidbits of information about the mills started falling out of it. So um, I inadvertently ended up researching a little bit on the mills and you know they're quite it's quite an interesting story uh, from my point of view I'm very much an amateur with an interest in local history if any of you um, would like to correct me or if you would like to share an insight or any knowledge you have um, or contribute in any way please feel free to do so and I'm not sure if Jared is here from the Mills and Millers of Ireland group um, Jared has been incredibly helpful to me and he's been very generous with his time and knowledge. So I'd like to say thanks to Jared from the from the off. You're, you're very welcome, Irene. Thank you very much, Jared. Great to see you. And I'll not hog your show. You actually have quite a few others from the Committee of Mills and Millers have taken up your invite to join. Oh, fantastic. All this evening. So I see our chairman, secretary, archivist, uh, on the call, uh, the editor of our newsletter is in here somewhere. You've gone to two screens now. Um, and there's a couple of others in here as well. So uh, we're very interested. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I really do appreciate you um, joining us tonight. Thank you. Um, OK, I'm going to start without any further ado. I'm going to share my screen. So if you'll just bear with me. Okay, um, so my presentation is on the mills of Craig and Drum Griffin. Um, and the first image that I'm going to share with you is the locations of the mill. Now, if you look, put my mouse here, three townlands border here at the locations of the three different mills. This here is the townland of Drum Griffin. We have all clogging up this side and Craig right here. So the mill that we're all familiar with, the beautiful landmark um, that we would call Craig Mill nowadays would have been known in the past as Drum Griffin Mill. Our clogging mill was just across the road from it on this side. And what was Craig Mill at the time was part of the Craig domain. So you can see how close they are together and you can see the water course coming into the different mills here. This is from the 1837 to 1842 OSI, OSI historic map, six inch color. Um, I've actually changed it to black and white just so that it's, it's more, um, so that it's easier to read. Uh, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to go through the history of the mills. I have quite a bit of information on the Craig and Drum Griffin mills, not as much on all clogging. Um, so I go through a little bit of the history of each of them and then look at the history mm -hmm. of the Wade family who took over all three mills and where we've ended up today. Um, so when I started looking at castles, uh, one of the first documents I looked at was the Book of Survey and Distribution. Um, and the Book of Sur Survey and Distribution was prepared by Brenton McGilla Collier with an introduction by Robert Symington. And Robert Symington did a huge amount of work on Cromwell and transplantations to Connacht. Um, and they produced this document from the quit rent books. And it gives us information on who the land, landholders were in 1641 prior to the Cromwellian transplantations and who the subsequent landowners were. So we can see here that Andrew Kerwin was the owner of a grist mill. You can see it there, a grist mill and a tucking mill under one roof. Now in this document uh, for the County of Galway, there were only 15 mills listed for the entire county. Most of them were just described as mills or little mills. There was one other grist mill that happened to be in Carrigan, and there were two other, uh, sorry, three other corn mills, and they were in Ballinakill, uh, two in Ballinakill and one in Ballinlock. Now, John Briggs was the person who the land was granted to, and if you can see this little arrow here, that indicates that the land was granted to him either by 
a certificate of court claims or a certificate of adventurers or soldiers or transplanters. And we don't know a huge amount about John Briggs, but he was connected to another guy called Thomas Sadlier. He would have been connected through marriage. Uh, he was from Tipperary. And Thomas Sadlier himself was a Cromwellian soldier. He was granted quite a bit of land in Anadown and in Galway. And he was governor of Galway in 1650. And at that time, he converted, he became a Baptist, which was viewed with great suspicion by the authorities at the time. But there's an island on um, the River Corrib called Jordan Island. And that John O'Donovan describes it as an Anabaptist island from Cromwellian times. I think it's quite likely that Thomas Sadlier was probably involved uh, in that island in his time. For some reason we're not sure about, it remained in possession of the Kerwins subsequent to the regranting. One reason for that could have been that Patrick Kerwin was praised by General Ireton for the protection of Protestants during the six month siege of the city. Um, it may have been that they, they bought it back and there's just no record of that. Um, in the Memorial of Deeds, which started in 1708, it could have been prior to that, or maybe they just didn't record it. But one way or another, the Kerwins did hold on to the land of Craig. Um, so moving swiftly on. Richard Kerwin was a descendant of these Kerwins. His father was Martin Kerwin. His uh, mother was Mary French. And he was their second son. The eldest son um, was granted the estate of Craig, but he was killed in a duel outside a coffee shop in 1755. Now, at that time, Richard Kerwin himself was a young man and he was a Jesuit novitiate studying in Poitiers in France. Uh, and when this happened, you know, he, he really went through a bit of turmoil, you know, trying to consider should he continue his studies or should he come home and continue the family estate? And eventually he did decide that that's what he would do. Now, however, um, Richard Kerwin, while he did spend some time in Craig, he was quite often an absentee landlord. He spent a lot of time in Menlo. He had married one of the Blakes um, and they resided there. After she had died, he spent some time in London and then he moved to Cavendish Row. Richard Kerwin is a fabulous eccentric character that I could speak about all day long, but that's for another day. But he first appears in the records, in the memorial deeds, granting knocked old to his brother, Andrew, and there was a clause in it, and I just need to move you guys out of the way for a second. Um, further that he, Andrew, and they shall grind his and their corn and mill his and their cloth at the mill of Craig aforesaid upon the like penalty of five shillings sterling for every grinding or piece of cloth he or they shall grind at any other mill. And I should have said when I was speaking about the mills that were there, there was a grist mill, which would be for corn, and there was a tucking mill, which would have been for wool or flax. Um, so uh, there were two other mills at the time in the book of survey and distribution, one in Laka and one in Kiltrogue. So while he wouldn't have been involved in the milling, it was obvious that there was an interest there in, in the mill and in ensuring that people locally were using it. Um, they said he was an absentee landlord and as was the case in with many of the mills, they were leased out. So the first record I found of the mills being leased, there may be others, was where uh, the corn and tuck mills of Craig with this wonderful um, description of them with the mill plot, watercourse, and a piece of reclaimed bog called Monin Yarug with the mill plot on one side and the large drain cut on one side on the ash grove opposite the gardens of Craig on the other side, together with an acre of ground in Oclogging in as full and ample a manner as the same was formerly held by the late Walter Burke of Craig to Francis and Richard Burke for a yearly rent of 31 pounds for 41 years. Now, Walter Burke was the father of Francis and Richard Burke as we found from um, subsequent deeds. So we can determine that Walter Burke had been um, operating the mill in Craig prior to 1789 at the very least. In 1802, Francis and Rickard mortgaged the mill to Christopher Bellew of the Mount Bellew Bellews, and he subsequently signed that mortgage to Paris Version Company in 1802. So at that time, people were mortgaging land. They were also taking out insurance on different premises. Beresford went back bankrupt, as can happen. And the mortgage interest was sold at an auction in 1818, and it was bought by Benjamin Bell. And then a really interesting deed came up. Francis and, in 1810, Francis and Richard Burke assigned same, same being the mill, to Samuel Warmby. And Samuel Warmby was a chemist's assistant to Richard Kerwin. He was very close to Kerwin and would have been a confidant. Uh, he spent some time in Craig, probably while Richard was there. 
and um, he was present when Richard Kerwin died. But Samuel himself, I doubt, had any interest in milling or uh, took part in any milling activities. I'm sure he probably wasn't even there at the time. Uh, so then Wades came along. Um, Richard Curran himself died in 1812 and his will was a, a long drawn out legal affair. He'd had two daughters, so there was no heir apparent and he had left, from what I can gather, his estate between the two daughters and their husbands. One of the daughters died in between when he died and when the whole thing was sorted out. Um, Patrick Kerwin was the, his nephew, the eldest nephew, so he would have been the heir apparent and uh, they squabbled over it for quite some time. The entire thing wasn't settled until the uh, early to mid 1820s when both Craig and Drum Griffin were sold in by auction and the purchasers were Francis Blake and Walter Joyce respectively. So the Blakes would have been in residence in Craig probably for about 40 years prior to purchasing the um, estate. They would have been leasing it from Richard Kerwin. In 1820, Francis Blake of Craig demised onto Francis Brennan of Craig Mills Miller and party thereof to Patrick Wade, eldest son of Philip Wade Miller in Winfield. So the Wades were Millers. They came from Winfield. There was another, um, another Wade, Francis Wade, who I believe had an interest in the mill in Shrule. And Francis Brennan had some connection to the Wade families. And we see that name, um, we see that name in future generations of the Wade children. Um, so there was certainly a close connection there. In 1829, a memorial of indenture, Walter Joyce demised onto Patrick Wade the corn and tuck mills of Craig and, uh, and Francis Blake and Walter Joyce, as I said, were the purchasers of Richard Kerwin's estate in 1825 and 1826. But that was Craig Mill. Uh, and what I'm going to look at now, and I will come back to the Craig Mill a little bit later, is what would have been known as the Drum Griffin Mill, but it's the mill we all recognise now as Craig Mill. There's some beautiful pictures there. I can't take credit from them. They come uh, from a website called craigmill.wordpress.com and they have um, a little bit of history on that particular mill as well. And there's a wonderful Wikipedia page on uh, Craig Mill too. That's definitely worth checking out. Um, you can see, uh, let me see if I can just bring my mouse over here. This would have been the location of the mill wheel. The mill wheel is no longer in existence there. Um, Supposedly it was sold to the Salt Hill Hotel. I did contact them to see if they had any history, but I haven't heard back um, from them. Um, you can see the entrance there, and this is the bridge. I think there's a third arch there as well. Maybe Rosemary, you might be able to tell me, um, leading into the mills. And that would have been where the water would have come in for both the Drum Griffin Mill, I think, and for the Craig Mill. Um, so, um, Skirts bought Drum Griffin off um, a, an adventurer during the Cromwellian times, his name was Colonel William Legg, and he was granted lands because he had supported the Cromwellian army by giving them money and they didn't have money to pay back. So anybody who supported the Cromwellian army was granted lands. Again, I don't believe that he would have ever set foot in uh, this particular area, but we do have a wonderful record of um, the sale thanks to Martin Blake's uh, papers. So. He got it as James Garrett would have been a descendant and he got himself into financial difficulty and his lands were sold. Um, and in the description of the sales, he says that it's near to the flour mills of Drum Griffin and this is dated the 6th of May 1784. So this tells us that the mill um, predates 1784. It was certainly in existence um, at that point. So that's an interesting snippet of information we you know we were aware it was kind of circa 17, 1780 but it's certainly older than 1784 and a guy called Helly Dutton performed a statistical and agricultural survey of County Galway in 1824 with a chapter on milling now he doesn't refer specifically to the mills that we are looking um we're looking at today but he does give an overview of it it's mostly in Galway City and he tells us that Mr Waddlesworth built the first flour mill about 40 years previous to this so 40 years previous to 1824. Um, the local bakers didn't like this idea at all and they subsequently burnt the mill. Um, now however Helly Dutton himself is um, He's not the most fantastic or reliable of narrators. John O'Donovan of the Ordnance um, Survey fame was no great fan of his. And in one of his letters, and I'll just read this out to you, he, he says, I've received Dutton's statistical survey of the county of Galway and looked over it. 
would find it will be of no use to me as he gives no authorities. He is a regular helter-skelter Irish writer who has not the organ of order very prominent in his pericranium. He knows nothing about Irish history or antiquities and has made no research whatever in that way in this county. I shall send it back again as it's not worth carrying. Beaufort's map, however, will be very useful to me. So uh, John, o, John O'Donovan um, was, you know, quite dismissive of his research. Um, so just in moving on. So Craig Mill, it was purchased by Marcus French and Anthony Scurry in 1675 from Colonel William Legg's uh, son. Uh, there's a few deeds. It was quite fragmented at the time, but there were a few deeds of interest. So in 1789, a guy called Paul Gannon took out a mortgage on one moti, and one moti means half of the mills, with Allied Bank. And it was adver and there was an advertisement on October 8th of 1789 too, where Paul Gannon's partnership with William Robinson was dissolved, and he stated his intention to purchase Robinson's portion and reside in Drum Griffin. Um, Ross Maguire would have been uh, the other named person in that particular deed. And in 1795, he granted one moiety to, uh, of Drumgriffin Mill back to William Robinson. So the mill during that time probably went between uh, Paul Gannon and another guy I'm going to talk about in a minute and William Robinson. And William Robinson held on to it for a while uh, until 1814, certainly where Michael Rooney, a Galway miller, leased the flour mill of Drumgriffin, lately held by William Robinson, from James Blake of Craig. And this again shows us that the Blakes were in situ in Craig prior to actually purchasing the estate. In 1820 then, Francis Blake leased, um, leased this mill to Francis Brennan and Patrick Wade. So at this point, they had Craig Mill, they had John Griffin Mill, and I would assume they also had a clogging mill. Um, came across this during the week, uh, one last Google, and it always throws something new up. But this was, uh, pro this is an article from the Journal of the House of Commons of the Kingdom of Ireland, volume 22 for Galway. Uh, oh, sorry, it's not for Galway, it's for the whole country. And it's an account of the flower sent by land carriage and canal to Dublin from the 24th of June, 1783 to the 24th of June, 1784, distinguishing the different counties, the names of the mills in each county, the number of miles from the castle of Dublin, the owner's names and quantities in hundredweight and the bounties paid for same. And we can see down here, is my mouse. We can see Drum Griffin down here, 110 miles from Dublin Castle. And the owner at the time was Richard Hickman and Company. And they would have been, according to this, the biggest supplier of flour to Dublin Castle. Now, I find that probably a little bit difficult to believe, but when I went researching Richard Hickman, I found that Richard Hickman and Paul Gannon were very closely aligned and they both had an interest in a particular mill in Galway, I believe in Furbo, called Captain Ayres Mill. And this is something that Paul Gannon, he, he set off his interest in that when he wanted to take over William Robinson's interest in Drum Griffin Mill. So I suspect that perhaps Richard Hickman and company may have owned a number of mills in Galway and maybe based themselves in an office in Drum Griffin. And this might have accounted for all of their mills. I could be wrong, but it seems unlikely that Drum Griffin would have been transporting more flour than Galway City would have had. Um, so that was a nice, interesting find. Patrick Wade got married in 1834, and we're lucky enough to have his marriage article. So when two people of means got married at, at that time, um, they would have had a legal document that would have outlined what each of them would be bringing to the marriage. And some of the, the items that Patrick Wade would have been bringing was all of the dwelling house, out of some flour mills of Drum Griffin with the water and water courses, to and from said mills, the mill dams, building yards, gardens and appurtenances, there to belonging to two small parks adjoining the garden west thereof, and the island of in island cellar north of said mills. So I hope you can see this map okay. We've got our three mills down here. Again, this was our Clogging Mill, this is Craig Mill, and this was Drum Griffin Mill. And I believe this area here was probably Island Sella. Now, I haven't found much more mention of Island Sella since. It may come from the Irish Ilan Salak, um, the, the dirty island, I'm not sure. Um, and this since, of course, is, has dried up. We still have the River Craig um, flowing through and going underneath that lovely bridge there at um, Craig Mill. But it was just another interesting little insight um, to the milling process there at the time. Okay, and then we come on to incredibly sad story of what happened to both Craig Mill 
and O'Cluggin Mill. So the first fire happened in 1834, and we're told here, where is it? On Saturday morning last, the extensive mills of Craig in the vicinity of this town, the property of Patrick Wade Esquire were burned to the ground. We understand the accident arose from the stones of the mill coming in contact with one another, one with the other, the miller neglecting to keep a proper supply of grain in the hopper. We have heard the amount of property destroyed by the raging element is estimated at, I guess that's 2,000 leave. We regret to add the concerns were not insured. The fire continued with great violence during Saturday night and Sunday. So this was uh, the mill at Craig. And then the second mill was the mill in all clogging. We regret to state that a fire of a very awful nature occurred last night at Craig in this county, by which the mill belonging to Mr. Wade was totally consumed and property to a large amount destroyed. So that was from the Freeman's Journal in 1853. And the Tomb Herald also reported in common with every man in this neighborhood, we do most sincerely regret the loss of property sustained last week by Mr. Pat Wade of Craig in the burning of one of his mills and the contents of a store. The premises were not, we believe, insured. The damage amounts, we are told, to nearly 800 pounds. So two of the three mills destroyed by fire, neither of them insured. Uh, the first one would be in 1834. The second one would have been just after the potato famine. Um, I suppose the way it was reported in the Freeman's Journal there at the 1834 um, fire, it does look like they really are kind of um, blaming it on Pat Wade's neglect to look after the mill properly. Uh, what I find really interesting is that we don't seem to have any folklore relating to these fires. They must have been massive, burnt for days, probably seen from miles around. And you would expect it to pop up maybe in school's folklore collection or just even through local oral history. But it's not something that I certainly have come across, uh, which I think is you know quite unusual. There would have been massive events. Um, and Jared, I'm incredibly um, grateful to you for sending me on the document um, about the repair of water wheels. And I've taken these graphics directly uh, from it. So this shows the different types of mill wheels that would be in use. And the first two here, we've got a breast wheel and an undershot wheel. And you can see, where's my mouth? You can see the water will come in through here in the breast wheel about halfway up and run out. And with the undershot wheel, it comes in from below and it just has a little bit of a, a race down. And then the pitch back and overshot, the water would come in from the top. Now, we don't have any record and it's not, unfortunately, um, it, it's not, uh, it's no longer available to us, the, the mill wheel, but the mill in Kill Row was a very similar building and it was built same era around 1780s. It had a similar ashlar facade um, and we do have a report on the building in Kill Row. Now it had two water wheels. Uh, the first smaller water wheel, which is still in situ, is described as a radial float undershot wheel and the second wider wheel is described as low breastfed. So I would imagine the wheel that was in um, Craig, Drum Griffin, which is now Craig, was probably either breast wheel or undershot, probably undershot. So I'm just going to play a quick um, video clip of Kilro in operation. Um, I do hope that the Donapatrick Kilcuna um, Society won't take too much offense to me borrowing their mill in their parish, but it just gives us a lovely overview of milling and how the whole thing operates. Oops, go back. The countryside was dotted with mills. These were tall stone buildings along river banks. The interior was a maze of belts, gears and wooden conveyors. The large water wheel was the source of power.
Sorry, that's my fault. Um, I'll continue on. That video is available on YouTube if you look up Bygone Days of Ireland Part 1. And it starts from about four minutes and 10 seconds in. It's a, a wonderful um, video depicting uh, Kil Kilroe Mill in operation. OK, so the next document I looked at after that then were the house books around 1844, 1845. And there's a huge amount of information in the house books on the mills. Um, so they tell they tell us that this one in particular is Drum Griffin or what we would now call Craig Mill. It tells us that it's a double flour mill. And it also says, note, uh, both wheels are of similar dimensions. Now this suggests that they may have been two wheels in that mill at some stage. Um, I'm not quite sure where the second wheel would fit in. There were two wheels in Kilrobe. There was one on either side of the mill, but the house is adjoining the mill in um, Craig Drum Griffin, unless there was one underneath it. Uh, but it gives us lots of information on the diameter of the wheel and the different pieces of equipment that they have. And I had a look at the four uh, mills that were in the vicinity in, this, in, in our area at this time. So we had the Drum Griffin Craig Mill, we have our clogging mill, we have Kilroe Mill, and we have Bunna Thubber Mill. Um, you can see that Drum Griffin Mill here, and I, there's a lot of information in here, but you can see that Drum Griffin Mill and Kilroe Mill were quite similar. Uh, they were both double flour mills. Their size here, this is length by breadth by height. We've got um, length 66, Kilroe Mill was 63, whereas Bunna Thubber was quite small, it was 17.6. Um, breadth was 26. 22, uh, over here 18, and um, 37, and 34. So there's quite a lot of similarities there. Both Drum Griff and Kilroe were flour mills. O'Cloggin was a corn mill, Bunathubber was also a corn mill. It gives the diameter of the wheels. The Kilroe wheel um, here seems to be quite a bit taller. I'm not sure that it actually was. Uh, there's quite a difference in the breadth of uh, the wheels. The one in Drum Griffin was two foot five inches and the Kilroe mill was four foot. And I do know that the mill to the, or the wheel to the right of that mill was much wider than the, the wheel on the left. Um, with number of buckets, which would have been the, the paddles that would have taken in the water, the fall of water, and we're given some information on the stones. The quality of the machinery is interesting. <clears throat> A would have been new, B would have been, you know, kind of quite good, reasonably good, and C would have been quite old. Um, the operation is quite interesting too. John Griffin Mill was down for being open wholly around day and night. That may have been somewhat of, a, of an exaggeration, but there's no doubt that it was quite busy at that time. Our clogging was six months of, in the year for 14 hours per day. Kilroe at the time, I think it may have been going through a period of transition. So it said that it worked about one month in the year for the people in the neighborhood, about 16 hours per day, and one of the wheels was out of order. But Kilroe was quite a busy mill during the famine period where they would have taken in Indian corn. So I imagine that might have been a temporary um, temporary situation. And the Bunathubber mill worked chiefly for the neighborhood, four months in the year, 12 hours a day. And there was just some other interesting notes on it. Um, and this O'Cloggy mill, of course, was burned on Friday, November 4th, um, 1853. Um, we are lucky enough to have another document in the Heritage Society, it's a document entitled a copy of the Anadown Allotments 1847. It was plotted by Thomas Brown and it was presented to Anadown Heritage Society in 1996 by the Devaney family. So Drum Griffin and O'Cloggin are both mentioned in it, Mr. Wade's mill and office, offices for 33 pounds. And Mr. Pat Wade, Wade held land and also mill and offices in O'Cloggin of, uh, for 11 pounds, um, five shillings. And this is one of the documents that attributes O'Cloggin to Pat Wade. Um, 
We can see her again in Griffith's valuation in 1855. We have Patrick Wade, he had house office, flour mills and 11 acres. He had land, his building there was worth 20 pounds. Um, so, you know, it was still quite a substantial uh, building and he also held other land in the area. When Patrick Wade died. Um, we can see here on April 6th at his residence in Craig County, Galway, fortified by the rights of his church, Patrick Wade, aged 70 years, may he rest in peace, he fell off his horse. Um, so on his death, and we can see there that he lived in the mill house in Drum Griffin. On his death, um, his son was Harward Wade. And Harward Wade, I'm not sure that he continued on the milling business. Harward had a bit of a falling out with Pierce Joyce. Now, in the time after the famine, um, a lot of the landed estates got themselves into difficulty. They couldn't financially support their estates and many of them were sold to the encumbered estates um, sales. Now, Craig did go through the encumbered estates, but it was bought back again by the Blakes. But Pierce Joyce had come into possession of um, the mill and mill plot of Craig. And at this point, it was, um, at this point, it would be Drum Griffin Mill described as Craig. Um, and he mortgaged the mill and mill plot of Craig. And he had prior to that given James Blake um, £16,525 out of trust. So there was a lot of toing and froing between the Joyces and the Blakes in that period. However, in 1883, the Joyces held the mill and the mill lands. And Harward appears in the petty court sessions, accused by Pierce Joyce of, on the 14th of May, 1883, at Air Square, wrongfully and without legal authority, did use intimidation towards Pierce Joyce Square with a view to prevent him doing an act which he had a legal right to do, viz. to set portion of land recently held by James Blake Esquire to any other person. Um, and Harward was sentenced to be imprisoned in Galway Jail for one calendar month with hard label, labour. He appeared on the same day in the prison registers, uh, May 21st. He was described as a farmer of Craig County Galway, which is really interesting because you would imagine if the mill was still in operation that he would have been described as a uh, miller. But he served his full month of um, hard labour and another interesting report to do with that. So a month later, on the 13th of June, 1883, um, the Lord Lieutenant revoked the licence to have and carry arms and ammunition, which was granted to Harward Wade of Craig Mills, John Griffin County, Galway. So what did Harward actually say to Pierce Joyce to land him in jail for a month? Well, this is what he said to him. Um, Wade holds a farm adjoining one lately held by Mr. James Blake, J.P. Uh, Craig, now in possession of Mr. Pierce Joyce, father of the plaintiff in the case. It appeared from Mr. Joyce's evidence that Wade came up to him in Air Square and, having asked was plaintiff's father in town and getting a reply in the negative, began to speak about the adjoining farm which was then vacant. In the conversation which ensued, Wade shook his head in a threatening manner and said that if anyone else got the land, there would be open murder. In cross-examination, Mr. Joyce admitted that he was not intimidated, but stated that the words were said with that intention. For the defence, it was contended that the words had no reference to Mr. Joyce, nor intended to be threatening, but applied solely to what would likely occur if a stranger got the land. Wade wanted the farm for himself, and as the fences were broken down, if anyone else got the land there, it uh, would be open murder. If anyone else got the land, there would be open murder, meaning continued quarrelling between himself and the neighbour. So he did a month of hard label, labour in the jail for that uh, particular uh, transaction with Pierce Joyce. It was possibly a little bit hard, but you wouldn't know what else was going on behind the scenes at the same time. Um, so it seems that milling certainly stopped. It was resumed in Craig in 1919 and um, it was set up as a limited company. And they advertised for sale 850 ordinary shares. The directors at the time were E. Kenny, Harward Wade, uh, Mary Ellen Wade, Reverend Patrick Nicholson, who I believe was the, the priest in Anadown at the time, and Reverend John O'Malley, I believe, was in Sherlock Moore, James Kenny, and John Sharkey. John Sharkey was of Roscommon. And um, the Kennys were um, Harward Wade's wife, James, um, they were her brothers, I would assume. And the secretary in the office was Michael Canavan. And it, it, you know, it reopened to great, um, to great furore and great aplomb. Um, and uh, a newspaper article appeared. It said the Craig Mills were restarted on Friday, 17th, 
when the very Reverend Father Hosty Parish Priest Anna Down, in the presence of a number of enterprising farmers from his own and surrounding parishes, gave his blessing and Godspeed to the undertaking. Those interested are to be congratulated on the success of their enterprise. It is not quite six months since the first labourer was employed, and there were only the four walls and the running water to start off with. In ordinary times, the job would be regarded as a six month one, but these are unusual times with shortages of material, delays in transit by rail and sea, and many other obstacles. The promoters, however, brushed these things aside, pushed on day in and day out, and can now point to a monument, small, no doubt by comparison, to enterprise energy and grit in a centre seven miles from a railway station. It is pleasing to see these old mills going once more. It speaks well for what Galway men can do. And it goes on to wax lyrically. It does tell us about Mr. Wade's father sent his goods all over the provinces. And apparently it was, you know, a mill that was renowned, um, you know, quite, um, quite widely for its enterprise. It didn't last. 1932, there was a petition to wind up the mill but it was refused. So 13 of the shareholders entered a petition to wind up the company. Uh, it was stated by the managing director that the capital of the company was 4,000. He had lent it 1,466. The mill made a profit one year, but there was an annual loss of about 80 pounds. So excluding the amount due to himself, the debts of the company were under 50 pounds. Uh, Patrick Varden was one of the shareholders and um, he had been a director too for many years until his resignation and they wanted a winding up order. Uh, they only represented 200 shares and there were 850 other shares sold. So it, it, they were not, uh, the petition was refused. However, it did wind up. So in 1935, an order was made by the judge at the circuit court at Galway in 1835 on the amended petition of Francis Braid, Brennan Wade, a creditor of the above named company, and it was ordered that the company be wound up by the said court under the provision of the Companies Consolidation Act 1908. Now, Francis Brennan Wade was, from what I can see, the only um, son of Harvard Wade and Jane Kenny. And you can see, I spoke earlier about the Brennans and their connections to the Wade. So the Brennan name lived on in Francis uh, Brennan Wade. So there was certainly a close connection there. In 1938, Edward Kenny, so Harvard's wife was Jane Kenny. I believe he was probably a brother. He was a creditor of um, Harwood Wade and Company in liquidation. He appeared before the High Court trying to save it. It was, he stated, monstrous to sell the mill in its present condition. The premises has been neglected. I don't want to see my nephew, Francis Brennan Wade, put out on the road. Uh, the case was dismissed uh, and uh, with costs. And it went on and on until uh, 1940, Craig Mills, Curran Dulla, an estate being administered by the court for many years was the subject of a further motion on the equity side at Galway Circuit Court. The motion was set out as follows, um, that in their suit to ask for £200 for machinery for costs and final orders, notice of motion for an order that out of the fund to be brought to the court, £80 to be paid to Mrs Jane Wade and the liquidator hand over possessions of Craig Mills to Jane Wade. So it was at that point um, that Craig Mills ceased to be an operating mill. However, the building was used again uh, during the rural electrification scheme where the ESB had their offices and that of course was a very important uh, point in time for Anna Down uh, and it was great to see the mill in use again. We are also lucky enough to be in possession of a receipt book from the mill and this is just one example. So this was 1938, it seems to be received from Mr George Hessian and um, can't quite make out the signature there, but it might be Laffey maybe. And there are a number of other receipts that we have. And finally, I would like to draw your attention to a particular, um, a particular story we have on the Anadown Heritage website about the mill house by Michael Stewart. And just to give you an idea of maybe why the mill ran into the ground, uh, Michael gives a description of Francis Brennan Wade or wading as he was, um, not sure if affectionately is the right word, but as he, he was known locally. They said that his mother had him spoilt in his formative years, allowing him to lounge in bed until noon, indulging his every whim and idiosyncrasy and ignoring her neighbor's advice to encourage him and making good use of his time by engaging in some worthwhile pursuits. As a result, he was considered locally as having had a misspent youth. She watched with pride as he rode to hounds with the Galway Blazers, 
having prepared the livery and polished the lashings, stoutly defended his disinclination to apply himself to the day-to-day -day running of the farmer at the mill, putting it down to the family's lineage and his being of gentle birth. He wasn't cut out for work, she would explain. He's too refined. Too refined for the mill. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. And um, I'd like to open it up now for any questions and answers, or questions and answer sessions you might have. Anything you'd like to share, anything you'd like to uh, contribute. Thank you very much for listening. Well done, Ari. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So does anyone have any questions or comments? <laughs> you need to unmute yourself. I think everyone is muted. The Moss, I think, has his hand up. Yeah, thank, thanks, Paul. Um, yes, Irene, two things, if, if you wouldn't mind, mm -hmm. please. One, yes. Uh, you mentioned Frule Mill in passing there. Yes. Do you know much about it, or is there anything available locally that says um, when it ceased, etc.? I believe, rightly or wrongly, that there was a drainage scheme initiated, mm -hmm. um, possibly by the or the works in the aftermath of the famine or thereabouts, mm -hmm. and that they actually, in draining the river, they caused the mill to be <laughs> unworkable. Okay. Would you, would you would you know anything of that? And secondly, if Gerard or anybody would be able to tell us a little bit about Kilbegley Mill, if they'd okay. know anything about it, please. That's just on the Athlone side of Ballinasloe. Super. Um, well, on I, I tried to limit myself. I didn't even research Bonnethover very much um, to these three mills. But certainly I'd be very happy to um, pass on my um, sources to you. Uh, a lot of the same information about um, about Francis Wade and Shrew would probably be available. But another recent um, fantastic resource that I found is the British Newspaper Archive that has a lot of the Galway newspapers that aren't available on the Irish News Archive. Um, so that would be worth having a look at too. But I can certainly send you on a list of the documents that I've consulted and you may be able to find something. I'd appreciate that. That'd be lovely. Yeah, Thanks. Certainly. Yeah. Wonder if Gerard has any knowledge of Kilbegley? It's a horizontal mill, I believe. I, I don't personally know. I, I oh, that's all right. Okay. No, I've, 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 I've visited the site a couple of times and I have some understanding of it. But, um, you know, it's just the workings of a horizontal mill, basically, you know. You know it's, uh, I might be able to help a little bit. Uh, Marcus Sweeney here from Mills and Millers. Um, oh, Marcus. Oh, yeah. There is, a, there is a, a beautiful publication on Kilbegley Mill, a government publication done at the time when they excavated the mill during the road construction. Uh, it's one of the more ancient types of mill, horizontal mills. A lot of tidal mills, for example, were horizontal. Yeah. They're a precursor of what we uh, we see as a modern water mill being a, a vertical wheel rather than horizontal. Mm -hmm. They weren't very efficient, low head as you can imagine, in fact they were horizontal. But if you had maybe five meters of tide, you didn't have to worry about the head. <laughs> and you certainly had it for a few hours of the day. Uh, but Kilbegley is a marvellous uh, discovery really, uh, which wouldn't have happened but for the road construction. And yeah. there is, if you, if you, if you, if you Google Kilbegley, I, I believe the publication is there. I've, I've read it myself, but it's a few years now since I read it. I read it when it was just published. Yeah, I think it comes under the NRA, but I, yeah. Exactly. It, it was yeah. a, a Rhodes job that they insisted on the archaeology being done, and uh, what, a, what a gem they discovered. They would have laid their undiscovered, <laughs> because the yeah. previous one was, of course, laid right across it. But they did, they did a really good job on the excavation, and uh, yeah, very so well, well recorded. And, uh, you just can't see anything of it today, though. No, no, no. no uh, I was there not, quite recently, you know, and not you. You wouldn't. You wouldn't know it had ever been there. Well, in Mills of Ireland, of Ireland, we we always say there was almost five thousand mills of Ireland just around the eighteen forties. Unfortunately, yeah. quite a lot of them are a pile of stones now. But what we should remember is that all those sites still exist, with a significant portion of them having the ability for the water to be reintroduced. And what a natural resource it is that's neglected uh, by in favour of wind and various other things. But it will have its day yet, I am sure. Uh, okay, uh, thanks very much, Marcus. Appreciate it. There's just one one question there. I'll, I'll read it out from the chat, Irene. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't see as, I am, as I am in England and unfamiliar with the area where the mills were, are 
any standing and if so what are they now used for if anything yeah so the only one that's remaining at that uh, in Anna Down at the moment is the Craig Mill and we have Rosemary here tonight who's uh, joining us from Craig Mill. So once it was sold off, um, it has been under private ownership since, um, I think it has passed uh, through a few different hands during that time period, but it's it's still there. It's it beautifully preserved, um, missing its mill wheel, um, and it's now a private residence. Kilro Mill is still in operation. I don't think that they're still milling, but they're, you know, there's still an agricultural um, point for farmers in the locality. Um, so that's what we have. And Martin has his hand up. Do you want to unmute Martin? Thanks, Paul. Uh, Irene, wonderful presentation. Thanks very much. That was wonderful. Um, I was actually at the site of the mill for the Bellews today, and it was nice to see that they were one of the top two flower um, exporters, we could say exporters, yes. to, um, to Dublin. Um, when you said about the wades, it, it mm -hmm. kind of like pricked my ears as well because the wades are still around the area and the, oh. the mill in Winfield is still mm -hmm. there. It yeah. was um, yeah. just restored a short time ago. And it's interesting that in the 1855, the wades were still there. Mm -hmm. Have you done any bit of genealogy to see Francis Brennan's relations? Are they still around? Not the Francis Brennan of the hotels now, but yeah. Francis Brennan Wade. <laughs> Just in uh, case, yeah. <laughs> Whether, well, they, I, are they still around? Irene, do you want to say anything yeah. about them? Um, I have not been able to link them at this point. Of course, I have, yes, tried to delve into the genealogy of it because that's what we do. Um, but I wasn't really able to get a huge amount because it's going back that that far. It was difficult for me to link them as a family. I don't know, Paul, if you got anything else on them. I think Patrick Wade, who came to Craig, was the son of Philip Wade of the mill yes. in Winfield. Mm -hmm. um, and I think his brother then had the mill uh, in Winfield. I think it's it's still recorded there in Griffith's valuation. But I think John, wasn't it? Yeah, I think somebody else yeah. had taken it over by 1901, but I don't remember. The, you probably know them better than me, Martin, over that side. Yeah, it was, they were from Cork, which was interesting. It was a mm. Birmingham family. Yes, yeah. And then by 1911, it just said Patrick Crahan Farmer. So I don't know if the mill was still in operation at that stage or mm. not. It but looks it's, like it's, it's, nice still, link it's still there, it's isn't interesting. it? It's still there, and the family that own it, I actually bumped into them the other day, and I kind of wangled an invite to go down and see it myself. So very good. I'm looking forward to doing that. Fantastic. But great presentation. Thanks very much, Irene. Thank I you see very that much, Mighty has his hands up as well. He has, yeah, Mighty. Yeah, muted. Um, yeah, I love that. Thanks very much. Uh, two questions, please, Irene, um, and thanks for the presentation. You, you say um, Patrick Wade married a Maria O'Farrell. Farrell. Mm -hmm. Do you know, was she part of the Farrell uh, Millen family? I believe Maria she was Roscommon. I believe she came from Roscommon. Let me just pull it yeah. up here until I have a look. I think she was. I think they might have had, they certainly had property in Roscommon, mm -hmm. whether it was a mill or not, I'm not sure. Let me just see if I have yeah, it here now. I found them when you said what he came into the deal with, and maybe she had. Brought she brought, brought property in Roscommon Town, I think, but I don't remember where, where we found that. I think it might have um, been. Um... Second question, then, uh, while you're looking there, was you don't ever came across who was it that built the mills or the engineers of the mills there, just have a personal interest in that with the Corcoran's being mill rights as well. I haven't. I haven't come across who the engineers were and I, it's something I would love to know. Um, there was a report done on Kill Row Mills, but it didn't, it didn't mention who they might be. Okay. Yeah. No, because our crowd are tied in with the fires as well and there, there were both millers and millwrights, so I just thought maybe they, if they'd show up, they might give um, more insight on how far yeah. our, our mills were down in Tune and Dramban and Adagool down to Moore and Milltown. So I'm just intrigued yeah. to see if there's any of them at Yeah, and we'll certainly keep working on it, and you never know what will pop up. Mm -hmm. yeah. investigation. Thanks. For that. Yeah, just Thanks on the Farrell time. side, Paul, if I could just come in, yeah, Irene yeah. and Mighty. Um, the Farrells of Roscommon, they actually, the Farrells of Mount Bellew Mills in the, in the 1950s 
were actually from Roscommon as well. So maybe there was a connection with them. And I think they were around that league at one stage, those mm. Farrells. So the name Farrell seems to be a Miller family, the ones in, in Tume that Mighty was speaking of there and the Farrells of Roscommon. So it's interesting that Millers yeah. are marrying Millers mm. because that would be kind of like the, the thing. Yeah. But anyway, sorry. It does like there, it sound like there should be a connection there, yeah. yeah. I just noticed there um, that Rosemary had posted up a message that I'd be very interested to hear more about. She says, we have a project in with GMIT to put the river to work. Um, happy to tell you about it, but that's about the height of it so far. Poor we students during COVID. We're very <laughs> hampered on progress. I'd love to hear some more about that. Yeah. Hold on, let me get the project manager on the line. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is my fiance, John, um, and it's a, a former uh, lecturer of John's who we went to uh, with our hands out and we said we live in this, this fabulous place um, and uh, can you can you help us put it back to work? So, John, do you want to? Yeah, so I've got, um, we, we did it over the course of the year and there's one student called Paul Lowry who's written up a whole paper, which I'm happy to send on to and I'll, I'll get his permission for it first, but I think he's kind of publishing it. Um, and it's just... What he's done is he's gone through some of the uh, various types of historical mills that would have been in this area um, with regards to just the technology. And he's also gone and contacted Irish fisheries and the OBW and so on and so forth. Just it's, it's more of a feasibility study than anything else. Um, and he's also found a couple of companies over in the UK that manufacture and install mills, or sorry, um, micro hydro uh, generation around the place. So um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of information in there which I'd be, I'd be happy to share. It's not our immediate plan to start exporting flour back to Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> this is more an electrification and sustainability measure. Um, and it might be, a, a, it will hopefully be a case that several students over the course of a few years mm -hmm. um, take it on and push the project forward, which would be really cool. It sounds absolutely wonderful. Best of luck with it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, while I, I have the floor a little bit, I'll just say we're absolutely delighted and honoured to be a little part of this history. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for doing this. And I really hope that someday uh, when all of this has passed, we can have you all over here. Uh, you can go out and measure stones or whatever it is. We'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Rosemary. One, one other little quick, quick question. Um, the, the, we found a, uh, what looks to be a flute lock um, uh, rifle or muskets in the in the garden. Um, any chance do you reckon that that might be similar time periods when Park Wade or what was his name Wade something anyway yeah. got his uh, wayward his, Hayward got his firearms <laughs> removed. Howard Howard Wade. I have to say Howard. when I came across that, um, Paul immediately said, "Oh my goodness, I bet that's the gun." Yeah, <laughs> so I say it's quite possible. Yeah. I contacted the National uh, Museum again today ahead of your uh, webinar in the hopes that I'd have some update for you, but uh, I'm sure they had a terrible backlog. It's still mm -hmm. sitting in our house yeah. <laughs> uh, in soil to protect it from degrading further. But if you have a look, I'll post the link to our Instagram. You can see some images of it before yes. I knew that I was in well, soil. It was wayward. He didn't store it very well. <laughs> he didn't, know. <laughs> Yeah, there's another question there, Irene. Um, yep. But the, what is the relationship between the mill and Craig Castle? Between the mill and Craig Castle, um, yeah, and I think that lady said that she 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 missed the beginning of it. Mm. So there were three mills in the beginning. One would would have been in the Craig domain, and that would have been called Craig Mill. That's not the mill that we would know as Craig Mill now, and that that mill burned down. But that would have been in the possession of the Kerwins and subsequently the Blakes. Uh, that would have been the one that would have been associated with the castle. And just from the bit of research that I've done, it seems that it was common enough to have a mill associated with a castle or, um, you know, quite quite a, a decent country house. Uh, I think it was probably status as much as everything else. So that, that other mill was on the other side of the river nearer yes. to the gatehouse in Craig. So there yes. probably is archaeological evidence of it still yeah. under the ground there, I'd say. And there's another question. Have you any information on Quakers in Roscommon? We had Wades and Farrells. I don't. That's, no. Yeah, I don't actually know. And if you have any information that you think might be relevant, we'd be delighted to get it. Um, anyone? John has his hand up there, I think. 
John yeah, Cunningham. Ronan. Oh, Ronan as well, actually. Yeah. Hello. <clears throat> yeah, uh, you can see there, can you? Yeah. Yeah. This, um, this sound is a bit ropey, but I think we'll get it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I can't um, uh, operate otherwise at the moment. Yeah. Uh, tremendous presentation, very interesting uh, altogether. Uh, can I ask Aaron what, when it actually closed? Um, because I remember visit, um, not visiting, going with my father to both Craig and to um, the Furies uh, uh, Mill uh, in uh, probably the early 1970s. Would that be right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, and and wh while I'm while I'm here, uh, I might as well recount a little bit of yes, uh, folklore uh, from my father. Um, it concerns the 1892 uh, general election, which was after the fall of Parnell, and um, the clergy obviously were on the anti-Parnell. Uh, it was after the death of Parnell as well, but you still had this split between Parnellites and anti-Parnellites. Um, so uh, in my father's telling of the story, uh, the uh, Parnellite sentiment was very strong in the parish and um, it was led by uh, Harwood Wade was one of the, okay. the leaders of it, as was, I think, was it Patrick Fury, whoever was the Fury in Bonatubber at that time. Yes. Uh, but uh, my father's version had this denunciation from the altar directed at the two men, and he referred to them in code as the rat from, from Craig Mill and the frog from the pond, the pond <laughs> being a reference upon a tubber. <laughs> so, so brilliant. It was, it, it but anyway, uh, the Parnellites uh, won the election. I think it was one of the six constituencies won by Parnellites and uh, uh, Colonel Nolan uh, was of uh, John Philip Nolan. I think Ballandary was the, was the successful candidate. So that would associate uh, the two with his candidacy if it's accurately passed down through the past 130 years. <laughs> That's brilliant. And like just in some of the research, just when I was searching Patrick Wade in the newspapers, uh, Patrick being um, Harward's father, but he seemed yeah. to be quite closely aligned with the church. Um, you know, he, there was a lot of um, there was a lot of mentions of himself and, and the Catholic Church at the time. So it must have been a, a bit of a, a, a change in their relationship with the church when Harward came along. Um, I don't yes, know. Father Gilton was the Eggleton, Eagleton, mm. uh, it was that my father named. I think he was subsequently parish priest and uh, Corifin. Okay, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, of it's the brilliant. Well, yeah. <clears throat> it's brilliant to get another yeah, I mean, insight into, um, into his personality because um, you kind of do develop a, an idea of what these people were like. And the only reference that I had to him really was the, the altercation he had with Pierce Joyce. So it's really interesting to kind of broaden that out and get a better idea of who he was. Um, mm -hmm. In relation to your question, I know you can still go to Furies, um, and I believe that Francis Brennan Wade was still in the mill house um, until he died. Um, somebody mentioned it uh, back there. I think he, he died in 1972. Mm. So I imagine oh. he could probably still have visited in his, in his time there. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Ronan has his hand up. Ronan, do you want to ask a question? Hi, uh, Ronan Jacob, uh, Mills and Millers, and you, you've met um, uh, uh, Jared and, and Marcus there. Just um, thanks so much, Irene and Paul uh, and uh, your committee members for inviting us uh, along. Um, it's just amazing how when you have the bones of the um, structure of a building and then you have the actual story behind it, how it comes to life. Uh, just uh, mindful of just looking at uh, the road to uh, partition and all of that recently aired on. And so it, it, it's the exact same experience. And so uh, my uh, compliments to, uh, you know, in terms of reading a book and the pictures that arrive into your head. So it's wonderful. Uh, and congratulations. Um, also, um, we had a meeting just before this and we're about to embark on something similar. So two of the participants are actually in view at the minute. And uh, 
So it's been uh, set in the bar for us. So uh, e even even more uh, important for us to be uh, uh, present. So thanks so much, and we've enjoyed it thor thoroughly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ronan. I really appreciate that, and thank you so much for coming. Um, all of the Mills and Millers gang, I really appreciate you being here. Yeah, well, it's it's your work through Jared has set the you know the foundations for this, and so. You know, it's, 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 it's wonderful. It's just wonderful. And so thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just to add to what Ronan said there, Marcus Sweeney here, uh, two questions that came up there, one in relation to Quakers, because mm -hmm. I live at a Quaker mill, uh, which I've restored. Uh, the Quaker archives are an absolute encyclopedic when it comes to if anything you want to know about the Quakers in Ireland. Christopher Moriarty there will be delighted to help anybody simple matter of picking up the phone or emailing them. Uh, the other issue to the much younger than I, people who are uh, in starting their journey and refurbishing a mill, uh, close to Ronan and my heart about re refurbishing a mill, <laughs> but you don't have long enough tonight to listen to that story. Any help we can be, um, uh, we'd be glad to help. Uh, if you Google the word Fancroft, F-A-N-C-R-O-F-T, uh, my mill will come up and uh, Ronan is at Annisbrook Mill in, in uh, near to Minality, famous for its steam trashing, is where I always remember it. So, so good. Very, very congratulations, this evening. Great presentation. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much. Tomas, did you want to ask another question? You, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, there's uh, a question there on the chat. Um, who worked in the mills? Are there any records of this? Not that I'm aware of at this time. Um, I imagine if there were any records in the mills, they're probably long gone at this point because it has changed hands um, a few times since. Um, so not that I'm aware of, unfortunately. And any information on Cunningham's and Mealy's connection to the mill? I don't. No, uh, well, maybe John would. That's that's our Cunningham's, not, not John's, I think. Yeah. Oh, right, your Cunningham's, sorry, yeah. Well, you might know so uh, much. No, yeah. they, they would have lived a few hundred yards away and would have definitely gone there um, and done business there, but no, no connection other than that, I think. So it's, it's very close. It's almost next door to where the Malias lived, yeah. Um, and is there another question there? Oh, Michael, Michael Henley has a question, I think, yeah. Just a comment. Thanks very much, Irene. That was fascinating. I'm probably the only one here who actually knew Francis Wade in person. Um, I remember him coming for a little his glass of Guinness most evenings. He was a quiet, inoffensive gentleman. Yes. Uh, but we all kind of knew his reputation as uh, near do well, you know, that he was <laughs> most enemy and that kind of thing. Yeah. I would have known him back around 1955, 56. And uh, at that time, at the mill, I th as far as I'm aware, had ceased to function as a mill. Mm -hmm. And he was just living in the house. Mm. And we heard eventually that the house was uninhabitable. He, he wasn't great for putting out the ashes and those kind of things. Oh, so it had become something of an unpleasant place to be. But I think at, at the last of the time he lived there, he used to go in and out a window. Oh, jeez. <laughs> And uh, finally, he moved actually into Galway somewhere. He was in, in rented accommodation somewhere in Prospect Hill, Bohemore area. There was a kind of a boarding house of some sort there that I believe he moved into. And um, I can't remember the name of it now, but it was from there then I subsequently heard that he had died. But he was, he was very quiet. But one time my father brought him to Chum. My father used to have a hackney car back in the days. And uh, they were into some pub on the way home. I don't know what the business was, but the business had been conducted anyway. And my father met some, my father being from outside, too, met some old school mates from his own days. And they were chatting and talking and Francis was there in the company, he wasn't saying much. And he was always, he was not passing any heat on him, you know? And all of a sudden he erupted anyway, that he, I suppose he felt he was being ignored and he started ranting about, he was no Joe Soap and his father fed the people of the parish in Black 47, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It wasn't in, his, in, his, in the character we knew at all. We really had the few pints. Yeah. He was being slighted in some way. I just thought I'd throw in that bit of gossip. 
Yeah, I believe he had, you know, the Wades had quite a, a high opinion of themselves. Certainly the, the mom, maybe, uh, Francis Brennan's mom, uh, Jane, I think they probably would have what we might call now notions, perhaps. But, um, but it's lovely to get a bit of background on him. And I see Mary Scully saying that um, he stayed with her in-laws in a B&B in Prospect Hill. It was the Royal next to the Western. That was it, yeah. Yeah. He stayed several weeks and then went to hospital and died. Thanks very much, Mary. And thanks very much, Michael. That, it's lovely to get a little bit of um, a, a bit of their character and, and to, to get to know the people behind the records. It was, uh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Michael. Yeah. I used to refer to him as Francie, and I remember him one evening, he was having a glass of Guinness in the local pub. Myself and my mother were trying to put an errant cow or an errant animal in a gate. And he saw we were in trouble anyway, we were having difficulty. And he came out unasked and helped us and went away about his business then again. Very civil and very polite. Yeah. Would doff his cap or his hat to the lady present and so on, you know? Lovely. Yeah, he sounds like a gentleman. Yeah. yeah. Uh, really. There was a, a question um, about, about, do we know about anyone who worked in the mill? I'm not sure that we do. I think Kathleen O'Shea is there. I think Kathleen's was it grand aunt maybe worked in the mill or in the, the house. You're you're muted, Kathleen, if you want to unmute. Maybe you have anything to add. Don't talk with her. <laughs> I worked in the mill. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when in the evenings we would take the cows. We we had a bit of land quite close to the mill. And when, when I'd go to collect the cows in the evening for milking, I would drive them up to the mill for a drink. And Thomas Laffey of Gardenham would be there, you know, and he'd be about to shut down things. And I would ask him, can I, can I sh turn down the, the sluice, you know? And I would stop the big wheel. So that's how I walked in the mill. <laughs> <laughs> I was about eight or nine at the time. And <laughs> I did that several times. That I did that several times, and then I would I turn it up again, start the wheel again, <laughs> and hoping Mrs. Wade wouldn't come out seeing what I was doing. Thomas, you know? <laughs> Thomas, Thomas Laffey walked in the mill. Thomas it? Laffey, Thomas Laffey walked in the mill, mm. and there was a Meek McLaughlin. I think he was from Abbey Knock Moy. He came in '45, I think, and but he had run away from home. He had run away. He was about 16 or 17. He had run away, and he stayed for about maybe he stayed. 10 months or so there, you know. Mm. So that's it. But I did work in the mill. I did turn down, I did turn down the snow <laughs> and I did raise it up again and started the wheel again. And you know. Yeah. Very good. Ka Kathleen I mean, was most obliging to let me do that. Yeah. You know. Kathleen, did you ever hear anybody talking about the fires at the mills? The what? The fires when they went on fire. Oh no, I didn't show you. No. See, it's only now I've come in. I've missed all your talk, um, yeah. Irene. I'm so sorry. That's okay. But anyway, that's it will be recorded, won't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, that's great. And yeah. I never heard of fire. No, I didn't. No. Yeah, it's interesting. I heard, that spoke of I heard how the Black and Tans came. The Black oh, and tell Tans us that. Came. Pardon? Tell us that. Tell her, tell her, tell us her, tell her, really the story. <laughs> come on, keep on. Uh, I know uh, Joe Linner's uncle would be working there at the time. And uh, they ran, they ran anyway, they ran, they heard, when they heard the noise of the, of the cross-reach tenders, they ran, they ran back to the back of the mill, the, the workers there. And one of them anyway was, at the time, was James Leonard, who later on went to Indianapolis. And <laughs> he was bent down somewhere in a drain, somewhere back at the back, way, way back at the back. And they say, you, so they called him names anyway, and they asked him how many, how many, how many uh, English soldiers he shot and that kind of thing, but they they didn't they didn't pursue any cruelty or anything like that. Okay. But Mrs. Wade came out anyway. The Francis's mother came out. She was from Crampton. Where is she? She was somewhere in Castle, some castle thing anyway in in Roscommon. The place was Castle something Castle Plunkett. She was from Castle Plunkett in County Roscommon. That's where she came from. And she came out and she begged the black and tans to turn to, to turn down the sluice like I had done. <laughs> it's a pity I wasn't there that day, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the black and tans, I'd say the black and tans of a job. <laughs> <Don't they? laughs> that was it, yeah. That's oh. all I could do. But I was often in the mill. Yeah. And God rest Teresa, Teresa Ford, uh, who became Fitzpatrick, and Paddy Ford, 
34 died in 93 and Teresa died in 2016. And I remember we come up and we'd ask Thomas Laff to let us up and we see the, the corn drying in the kiln. And we, he opened the door and we jumped in and we could we were walking around the corn. Oh my <laughs> we had god. Our shoes on, Emma. We had our shoes off. <laughs> I don't have any <laughs> shoes on. Come on. <laughs> we could feel the heat coming up, you know, we were walking around in the corn. Oh, she was grand. We could feel the heat coming up. That's it. Thanks very much, Kathleen. That's brilliant. That's all. Oh, sure. That's it. Yeah. That's all right. Uh, so back again, Kathleen. Give us another Tell the story Patty Lynch. Yeah. Pardon? Tell the story about Patty Lynch there. The story about <laughs> Patty. You know about Patty and... Oh, Patty. Yeah. Come on, tell me that story. You're good at that. Who's that? Who's that? That's... Hello. Tomas. Tomas will do that. <laughs> Go on, tell the story about Patty and Francis. Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Patty, Patty Lynch, God rest him, who died, he was killed outside the, the mill in, 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 in 2008. Oh, yes, yeah. And uh, he was about six or seven. And uh, he, his mother made a, made a brown cake for, Mrs., for the Wades and sent, and sent up a bottle of milk and a, and a roll, of, roll of country butter. She gave it to Patty, Patty to bring to take up to the, to Mrs. Wade, and this was six o'clock in the evening. And we, we, you know, we, well, I suppose Francis was a bit like myself. He was a late a late starter, getting up in the morning and getting to the evening. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, anyway, Mrs. Wade, she was calling Francis anyway, but eventually Francis was giving her no heed, and uh, she sent Patty up, and he said, "Get down, you little cur!" He said, oh, Patty." <laughs> Whatever a call is, I don't know. Dog, dog, <laughs> Go dog. down, you little call. Yeah, dog. Patty would tell that he laughing. And he'd call me a little call, Patty would say. And <laughs> he just took it in stride anyway. Yeah. Go down, you little call. <laughs> but uh, about Francis, Francis really was, he would never, I don't think he ever offended anybody. Yeah. He was very, very polite. Mm. A very polite man, you know. That's and and innocent in many ways, in yeah. many respects, he wouldn't be. He didn't fit in in the area really. He was too. I don't know. He was too. He was innocent really. Yeah. You no, know, he was an innocent kind of a character really. Yeah. He wouldn't. He wouldn't know any crooked dealings or anything like that. I must say we're all crooked, right? <laughs> 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 Francis wouldn't know. I couldn't. I can't describe him. Yeah, I'd have to think about it. <laughs> like he was, he was different anyway. He was a different yeah. character, and he was always he was always polite to everybody. You know. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, he was. Really. God rest his soul. Yeah. 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 John Cunningham has his hand up. I'm not sure if that was from before or do you want to okay. add something else, John? Uh, no, it's from Ronan. Do you want to? Yeah. It's from it's from before, but but I, I actually um, I've lost it now. Um, but uh, just to say, if I could squeeze it in and be a little bit cheeky, that on the tenth of July, um, all being well, but we will be in contact, and Jared, of course, will be in contact. Um, you know, as the um, uh, uh, link man. Uh, but that we hope to have uh, three speakers uh, speaking for about twenty minutes, and uh, we'd love if uh, you could all join us on that day, so it's about 11 o'clock, but details will be um, uh, advertised uh, well in advance. So you'd be, you'd be all most welcome. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ronan. Yep. And just about but, to but, stand But obviously you know, we'll be nervous, I haven't, haven't witnessed this spectacular <laughs> <laughs> broadcast. <laughs> so. Oh, thank you. Yeah, be nice. No, 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 I've just finished typing the email and I'm about to hit the send button to Irene. We'll, we'll send that around then. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we'd be nice to. Yeah. So, does anyone have anything else to add? Or any other questions before we finish up? I'd just like to say thank you to everybody for all of the questions, all of the feedback, um, and for everybody who's thanked me on the on the chat as well, and for all of your comments. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it, and uh, there's been some wonderful feedback. Thank you. Uh, Pierce, Pierce Murphy here. Uh, thanks very much, um, uh, Irene, for, for a lovely presentation. And uh, it brought back some memories uh, to me because um, a number of families uh, left Gardenham 
uh, to go to Belleville where they got um, new holdings. Uh, but they always came to Craig to have their uh, the corn uh, mill because they felt it was much better. There was a better job done than than uh, any of the local mills in, in near Belleville. There was one in Athen Rye at the time, which was a lot nearer, but they would always travel back to, to Greg to get the, the corn. That was up until, you know, it closed down, I think, the, the 40s. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a very interesting detail, isn't it? But quite a distance to travel from Belleville back to Craig, but obviously they value the quality. That's right, yeah. Work, yeah. And they could vi and they could visit the, the some of their old friends in Garnham at, at the same time. Mm -hmm. and, but thanks very much, uh, Paul and Irene, and uh, a fantastic uh, presentation. Thank very you. much. Thank thanks, you. Pierce. <clears throat> okay, um, we'll draw proceedings to a close. I think so. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined. There was, I think, up to 55 participants at, at one point, which is great. A fantastic crowd. And thanks so much to Irene for, for such a wonderful talk. It's, it's great to, to get such an insight into the mills and to have such an interest in it. So th thanks, Irene, for that. It's much appreciated. Thanks.